My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of the Evo Institute for Jewish Research. Thank you all for joining us tonight. So I think it's a lot of uh, Evo regulars and people from the Evo Summer Program, so forgive me a moment of just um, for those that are not Evo regulars. Uh, Evo is a library and an archive at its core which um, documents and preserves materials related to Jewish history and Jewish culture. And a lot of the, we do a lot of different things in addition to having this uh, documents from our archives and our library accessible through a reading room which we share with the other members of the Center for Jewish History here. Um, and most of what we do is to make that material um, and that culture accessible in a variety of different ways. So one of the ways that we do that is through public uh, per performances and lectures and book talks um, like what you're seeing today. Um, and another way that we do it is through our education programs. And so many of the people here are students in our uh, Yiddish immersion summer language program. Um, so we welcome them all to you. We're very excited to have them here with us for the next six weeks. And this series of lectures that's beginning today is a part of both the, the summer program of Yiddish instruction and also a part of our public offerings. Um, so we're really excited to be joining um, the two departments together for this and to make accessible to a broader public um, a, this series of lectures which is for the summer program students. So this, this lecture series which we're calling Yiddish Civilization um, covers a, a bit of the breadth and some of the depth of Yiddish language culture um, not just in Eastern Europe but in America and around the world. So I hope that you'll join us for more of the lectures uh, in the next few weeks. So that all said, we're really thrilled to invite um, Naomi Seidman to the stage, who's going to be giving the first lecture. Naomi Seidman is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department of the Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora Trans and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. Her book, Sarah Schenerer and Basie Yaakov, a Revolution in the Name of Tradition was recently published by Littman Library. We had a wonderful launch party for it here, actually. Um, Seidman did her research for this book as a part of Workman Circle, Dr. Emmanuel Pat, visiting professorship at the Evo Institute in 2012, um, and as an NEH scholar, uh, senior scholar at the Center for Jewish History 2016 to 2017. So we're thrilled to have Naomi back to be giving this lecture. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Seidman. So 
sein, mein Gott ist gar nicht da. Und Liebe soll sein, kaum und roh, abpustet träum, zerbrochen und mich hole. Sie nicht kein Gewein in Mitternacht, nicht kein bald Schuhe auf gewacht. Nur an Elmte kommt keiner. Kaires rufst du mich, mit Schem Hawaii lässt er ich, nur Mele, ich der war nicht kein Geule. Nur es brennt sich heiß in jeden Ost, von Aleph Beis, Gor bis in Sof, die Heilige und Kale, Halleluja. Es ist nicht kein Sache, ich mach der Weile, was ich mach. Ich komm da wie ein Mensch, nicht kein Schaluja. Ich hab's alles verloren, sei wie sei, will ich verleugnen, Adonai, und schreien will ich heim. Halleluja, Halleluja. say uh, uh, a real thank you to Yivo. Actually, um, I think there are people here who are just starting their first day of the summer program. So I was, uh, 1991 was my, my, really my summer of learning Yiddish, the only formal education I had in Yiddish. It wasn't taught at UC Berkeley where I was a graduate student. Um, it was here at Yivo. So I really owe Yivo so much more than I can say. Uh, really giving me and not just an academic career but uh, uh, such a richer life than I would have otherwise have had and the time that I've spent here in this building have, have just been among the most wonderful moments of my life. Okay, so, so how much Yiddish did Freud know? Evidence of at least some knowledge lies buried in footnotes and private correspondence or paraded in plain sight. An odd neologism in a dream he had, Yiddish curses in the posthumously published notes for the rap man, the only notes that, that Freud didn't destroy, references to Jewish customs, the three weeks, if everyone knows what that is, in personal letters, the schnurrers and the shadchanim that populate Freud's book on jokes, a biographical report that Freud's mother spoke only Yiddish to the end of her days, and he visited every Sunday. This well-thumbed pack of cards has by now yielded a scholarly consensus. Freud knew more Yiddish than he was willing to admit. It isn't just we who are asking the question. The American Yiddishist and psychologist um, A. A. Roback, corresponding with Freud about a festschrift in honor of Freud's 80th birthday, confessed that it would please me to know that you speak, read, or at least understand Yiddish. Personally, I think the nation cannot exist without its own language. Freud answered, Yiddish habe ich nie gelernt oder gesprochen but he tried to soften the blow by signing off with an expression of that sympathy which your valiant championing of our people commands. Freud does sympathize with our people, but only when Robach commands him to. 
But my aim here is not to rehearse the question of how much Yiddish Freud knew or provide you again with an answer. What interests me is rather the question itself. Why do we want to know? What do we want to know? What does the question already assume? What, it's a, what is its shape, if a question can have a shape? And why does Roback ask it so delicately? Why did he so dearly hope that Freud's answer would be, yes, I know a lot of Yiddish. What is this pleasure he was hoping for, and why is Freud so disinclined to supply it? To turn to the less delicate scholarship of more recent times, what explains the aggression of the question, its desire to strip Freud of his cover, to expose what he was trying to conceal? Why is this game of hide and seek so central to the enterprise we call Jewish studies, and certainly in its approach to Freud. It's just this aggression that Derrida points out in Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi's book on Freud, which brings back the ghost of Freud in order to have Freud's ghost say, yes, I do know Hebrew, and that yes, psychoanalysis is, despite all my disavowals, indeed a Jewish science. It is this performance that Derrida calls Yerushalmi's attempt to perform a second circumcision on Freud, to impose Jewishness on a dead man who can defend himself even less than an eight-day-old boy. It may be a sign of the aggression embedded in this game of hide-and-seek that it persists beyond the point that we have the answer. We want to know what we already know. Freud is an assimilated German-speaking Jew, his parents, O student. Of course he knew Yiddish, and of course this knowledge would be concealed in the ambition to found a new science, remaining a private code, code to be indulged among family and friends, or constituting a shameful secret to be delicately probed or aggressively exposed. We're in the presence here of a structure, let's call it the linguistic architecture of modern Jewish consciousness, and it's familiar from a host of other examples. Not all Jewish writers were shy about sharing their reflections on this condition. Elias Kennedy, who took a similar path to Freud's from east to west, reflected on the difference between the way his childhood Ladino and Bulgarian persisted in the German he learned later. Fairy tales I first heard in Bulgarian, I later remembered in German, having somehow translated themselves into that language. But certain especially dramatic experiences, murder and manslaughter, so to speak, and the worst terrors have been retained by me in their Ladino, Ladino wording, and very precisely and indestructibly at that. George Steiner, younger and thus more distant from a native Jewish tongue, provides this map. I have no recollection whatever of a first language. So far as I'm aware, I possess equal currency in English, French, and German. What I can speak, write, or read of other languages has come later and retains a feel of conscious acquisition. Even these three mother tongues were only a part of the linguistic spectrum in my early life. Strong particles of Czech and Austrian Yiddish continued active in my father's idiom. And beyond these, like a familiar echo of a voice just out of hearing, lay Hebrew. These linguistic self-portraits, for all their specificity, may allow us to nuance the question of how much Yiddish Freud knew or Freud's answer that he never learned or spoke Yiddish. Yiddish and Hebrew, in some historical and psychic formations, are not languages, but fragments, particles, accents, voices that lie just out of hearing, a kind of pressure or deflection or distortion of one language by another. And while Kennedy and Steiner trace their own eccentric idiolects, the languages of an individual are, are, of course, never hers alone. They come from elsewhere, whether this elsewhere is the Jewish family or the Gentile street, 
and are shared as part of the social intersubjective character of language. Steiner suggests that the polyglot matrix in which he was raised was far more than a hazard, a private condition. It organized, it imprinted on my grasp of personal identity, the formidably complex, resourceful cast of feeling of Central European and Judaic humanism. I would suggest that what reverberates in the question of Freud's knowledge of Jewish languages is itself a feature of these languages, a myth or ideology about their meaning and structure. It's what we know when we ask how much Yiddish Freud knew, and it's shared by academics and by everybody else, jokes, folklore, um, and it forms together a myth of Jewish linguistic modernity. And to summarize the myth, Jewish languages persist within or behind non-Jewish languages which are acquired later as a past that continues to reverberate in the present or as an interior concealed within these other tongues. It's only the existence of such a myth that explains the joke or the joke type of Mrs. Cowan at the country club. Um, and does everybody know the joke about Mrs. Cowan at the country club? Mrs. Cowan at the country club. She's sitting at the country club. The waiter comes, brings her the soup, spills the soup. She says, Eugewalt, whatever that means. I guess a couple of you haven't heard it a lot of times. Has a long beard, despite being about a woman. A Jewish, a Jewish tongue in this joke, and I'll just point out that if you laughed at that joke, and I have told that joke, and it's hard to tell jokes in academic talks, they tend to, but I've told that joke to people who just don't get it. And I'm just assuming that the fact that you all get it means that you understand this ideology or myth. A Jewish tongue lies buried beneath the crust of other languages acquired later and through interactions with non-Jews. And this Jewish tongue is liable to erupt at moments of stress. The same ideology, I would argue, underlies scholarly investigations too. Max Weinreich, for instance, I hope you all know who he is, distinguishes between external and internal bilingualism languages shared by Jews and those used with outsiders. This terminology, for all its apparent neutrality, rests on a set of value-laden spatial allegories in which internal and external carry along with them a host of other charged binarisms, self, other, inside, out, deep, shallow, authentic, spiritual, truth, falsehood. Jewish languages are those which express and embody the interior of collective Jewish life and the interior of each Jewish individual. Languages shared with non-Jews are correspondingly exterior with all that topography implies. Turning away from or forgetting a Jewish language modifies but doesn't fundamentally vacate this structure. Weinreich hypothesized that Yiddish persisted not only in the speech and accent of German-speaking Jews, but also somehow within German Jewry, exercising its effects in some fragmentary and distorted form for at least four generations, he says, after losing its vernacular status. For all its currency, this conception of Yiddish or other Jewish languages as forming the deep interior of the Jewish self is not inevitable. A more traditional Jewish map uh, places not European languages, but Hebrew over Yiddish, literally, as in Rav Nachman's stories, in which Hebrew is at the top and Yiddish is at the bottom of the page, even when the Yiddish is the original, the spoken original. What changes is not the relative position of Yiddish on the map. It's at the bottom in both formations. What changes is what being on the bottom means, the meaning and potential value of loneliness. This ideology of these languages itself has two dimensions. In the one that reigned first, Yiddish was low 
as a despised jargon, as the language of the Eastern European unwashed masses, as a language suppressed in Western European acculturation, as a woman's tongue. But in its recuperation, Yiddish could also become the language of Jewish intimacy and at-homeness, of Jewish interiority as authenticity, the marrow, the mamaloshen, the spintle yid. As the French psychoanalyst and Yiddishist Max Kahn says, the very unconscious of the modern Jew. Loneliness, to put this differently, became a psychological feature of Yiddish and modernity. Uh, in other words, a psychological feature of Yiddish and modernity, as opposed to a structural one. And in fact, the analogies between the stratified Jewish linguistic consciousness that views a Jewish interior as buried beneath a European exterior or facade bears some striking similarities to Freud's theory of the unconscious, his theory of a stratified psychic self. Of course, the psychic architecture that views the self as constituted by an inside versus an outside, an exterior versus an interior, a private versus a public, precedes and exceeds psychoanalysis as a mode of conceiving the, the self. And Bachelard, in The Poetics of Space, explores the isomorphism of self, body, and house, reading the anxieties of everyday life as emerging from a tension in every psyche between claustrophobia and agoraphobia. The apparent, by the way, this picture is, is right outside there. That's where I first saw it, the image on the right. It's from the first um, uh, Jewish medical textbook. Um, the apparent universalism of the trope that figures self or body as house, house as body or self, also has specifically Jewish expressions. Um, this distinction between inner and outer, secret and revealed, is also marked as the very structure of the modern Jewish self, encoded in and charged by the famous Haskalah slogan, um, often mistakenly attributed to Mendelssohn, be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. This advice was also linguistic. In the 1866 poem in which it appears, Gordon exhorts the Jew to speak in the language of the Gentile neighbors who stretch out their hands to you in peace. Whatever Gordon may have meant by recommending that Jews speak Jewish languages only at home, later nationalists took it as unwelcome advice to hide the Jew in us in the secrecy of our tent, as if it were a disgrace to be a Jew. And if we are to believe Yirmiyahu Yovel, the very alienated self of modernity in general may have Jewish roots or Jewish Christian roots in the experience of converso identity, split between a Jewish and Christian self, a true self and a facade. Um, this is the uh, uh, image of a book, a medieval book, which is a dialogue between a Jew and a Christian who are the same person. Moshe, Moshe Al, uh, Alfasi, I think it is, and Petros, his name after he converted to Christianity. Petros wins their debate. Um, Foucault traces, uh, uh, so Foucault traces a genealogical connection between the Christian requirement to confess one's sins and Freud's couch without explaining the leap from Christian to Jewish space. The figure of the converso may bridge this gap, connecting the crypto-Jew ferreted out by the Inquisition with the neurotic compelled to speak her most shameful truths. To be sure, Freud's main resources for describing the stratified psyche are not drawn from Jewish history, but rather from archaeology. It's Egyptian, Greek, and Roman artifacts that populated, overpopulated his consulting rooms. Um, with the exception of two Kiddush cups, the keen-eyed Yerushalmi spotted in a photo that apparently, this, these photos were taken the week that Freud was um, leaving, packing up his stuff to leave Vienna under threat. Um, somebody came and sort of cataloged all this material 
um, to have a photo, uh, f photographic evidence of Freud's possessions, and somehow the two silver Kiddush cups that you see there um, by Edmund Engelmann disappeared um, on between Vienna and England and London. The role played by archaeology as the central metaphor and the topographical model of the psyche derived from Freud's boyhood interest in the excavation of Troy, of Troy, but Freud was participating in a Europe-wide craze for archaeology. The scientific basis for the fields of both geology and archaeology, the notion that layers of rock and gravel could reliably be dated to different geological or historical eras, those bases were developed within Freud's lifetime with far-reaching effects on many fields beyond psychoanalysis. But archaeology played a role in psychoanalysis from the very start, appearing in Freud's 1896 paper on hysteria, his first real psychoanalytic work. And I'll quote, imagine that an explorer arrives in a little known region where his interest is aroused by an expanse of ruins with remains of walls, fragments of columns, and tablets with half a face and unreadable inscriptions. He may content himself with inspecting what lies exposed to view, with questioning the inhabitants that live in the vicinity, but he may act differently. He may have brought picks, shovels, and spades with him. He may clear away the rubbish and uncover what is buried. If his work is crowned with success, the discoveries are self-explanatory. The numerous inscriptions, by good luck, may be bilingual and reveal an alphabet and a language and when they have been deciphered and translated, yield undreamed of information about the events of the remote past to commemorate which the monuments were built. By now, psychoanalysis and archaeology are so mutually entangled that Freud's analogy is just obvious. The psyche is a stratified site in which events of the remote past lie buried under layers of sediment, the this, this psychoanalyst is a traveler with a shovel, rejecting the tall tales of present-day inhabitants, the family of the patient, in favor of digging deeper. The monument is a symptom, a dream, a concrete manifestation of a trauma. But what about that curious detail of the bilingual inscriptions? Freud was probably thinking of the Rosetta Stone the most famous bilingual, multilingual monument deciphered in the course of the 19th century. Just as the Rosetta Stone enabled the deciphering of hieroglyphics through the demotic and Greek equivalents, Freud posits that psychoanalysis can be a form of translation from desire or trauma into the hieroglyphics of dream or symptom. Dreams and hysteria, Freud argued, were a pictographic script, which itself was a translation of a trauma into a mental image or a corporeal sign. The dreamer translated these images into speech in the psychoanalytic session, and the, psychoanal the psychoanalyst translated them back into trauma or desire, reverse engineering the process that first generated, generated the symptom or dream. But perhaps the stone buried within Freud's topographical model of the psyche is also a more specific kind of monument to a lost past, which is to say perhaps it is the multilingual patient whose hysteria provided the impetus for Freud's 1896 essay. Anna O was a member of Freud's multilingual Viennese milieu, Breuer's patient, but part of the same circle in which Freud uh, moved in. She was not only a primary model for the theory of hysteria that Freud and Breuer were co-constructing of the connections, conversions, and translations of trauma, desire, body, symptom, dream, but also the one who made the all-important connection between all of those and language. To review, Anna O's illness began when she was 21 and nursing her dying father, and it manifested herself in a range of symptoms, including hallucinations of snakes, 
um, contracture and paralysis of first her right arm and then her entire body, and to quote Breuer, a deep going functional disorganization in her speech. As the case study describes her, she was at a loss to find words, and the difficulty gradually increased. She lost command of grammar and syntax, and in time became almost completely devoid of words. She laboriously constructed sentences out of four or five languages, and she wrote in the same jargon that she, had, that she spoke in. By versuchen zu schreiben, schrieb sie demselben jargon. In the midst of this illness, Anna discovered and coined the term in English, the talking cure, which Breuer claimed healed her. She wasn't actually healed. Her illness lifted, he writes, when she began to speak about her situation, at first in her paraphrastic jargon, but she became more fluent as she spoke until she was speaking quite correct German. It was in recounting the origins of her illness that Anna O remembered the moment her speech vanished. She was sitting at her father's bedside and saw a black snake approaching. She tried to ward it off with her right arm, um, which was over the back of her chair, but it had gone to sleep. And in terror, she tried to pray, but could find no tongue in which to speak. If Anna O is the Rosetta Stone, buried within the founding metaphor of psychoanalysis, there might be another language concealed beneath her German, English, Italian, and French, signifying or obscuring the events of the ancient past. Her speech impairment, the loss of grammar, the decomposition of proper German, is named by Breuer her jargon, jargon, the pejorative term for what later was called Yiddish. Nor does Breuer identify the language in which Anna was trying to pray when, her, when she first lost the ability to speak. Whatever languages Anna O oh might have known, there's no question that Bertha Pappenheim knew both Hebrew and Yiddish. I, I think you all know that Bertha Pappenheim is Anna O. Oh. Um, decades after the hysterical disintegration of Anna O's oh German into jargon, Bertha Pappenheim became a translator from Yiddish into German as a feminist contribution to what has been called the German Jewish Renaissance, which mined tradition for resources that might help heal the alienations of modernity. It was in this effort that she translated such old Yiddish sources as the Tzenarena, the Meisebuch, and the memoirs of Glickel of Hamlin, a distant ancestor, into modern German. But she also translated from German into Yiddish, which is harder, it meant she really knew Yiddish. A 1912 entry in her travel journals complained that her, hands were, her hand ached from the strain of writing all night from right to left. She was translating a report on Jewish prostitution for the Alexander Rebbe. A snippet from the journal entry on that visit records a conversation she had with the Rebbe's sister in a melange of Hebrew, Yiddish, and German, biblical quotation and folk idiom, exactly the thing that had, you know, was considered a symptom in Freud's view. As Pappenheim, if not as Anna, she also found the words to pray, composing a collection of German prayers, Gebete. Whether or not Anna's disorganized, ungrammatical, pathological, hysterical jargon was Yiddish, or Yiddish linguistic interference on German, Pappenheim clearly saw her recuperation of Yiddish as a different kind of cure, talking cure, in which the denigrated language lurking beneath the European tongue is finally allowed to have its say. From this perspective, Breuer's failure to cure Anna O oh is inextricable from his failure to name the language of her lost prayer. But this forgotten text may be an old Jewish story. Psalm 137 is very nearly a paraphrase of Anna O's hysterical symptoms. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill, may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. Freud's archeological site may thus include the barely decipherable inscription of a Jewish tongue. 
If we count Freud alongside Anna O oh as another Central European Jewish multilingual, then his text too bears the traces of this condition, the hieroglyphics that press upon or are waiting to be unearthed beneath his proper German prose. Is Yiddish buried beneath his German or only lost in its prehistory? Does it linger just beyond earshot? Is it conscious? Is it even a language? Is it a trace of an accent, a fragment of culture, a shadow of a habit of thought, a refraction, a disorganization of German, as Yiddish might be said to be? But I'm acutely aware, as you no doubt are as well, that I've fallen into the very pit I was hoping only to describe. In rousting out the Jewish multilinguals buried in Freud's archeological site, in wielding my shovel and pick, I too am participating in the game Derrida charges Yerushalmi with playing at a dead man's expense of imposing a Jewishness he's in no position to deny. Yerushalmi, I would add, was performing a second circumcision in attempting to show that Freud knew more Hebrew than he was willing to admit. But associating him with Yiddish may be a greater form of symbolic violence, a castration rather than a circumcision, given the associations of Yiddish and femininity. It's a weak defense to point out that Freud himself played this game. His book on jokes shows how well he knew its rules. Here's the famous joke about the Baroness confi Baroness's confinement, in which the normative facade of European languages is broken by the psycholinguistic eruption of a more primal layer of consciousness. I'll just tell the joke. And since it's an academic talk, I won't have high expectations. So the doctor is looking after the Baroness at her confinement, um, and he pronounces that she's not yet ready to deliver and suggests to the Baron that they have a game of cards in the parlor next door. Um, they're playing cards and they hear a cry of pain from the Baroness. Oh, mon Dieu, que je souffre. Her husband springs up. The doctor says, it's okay, it's okay, it's nothing. Let's play another round. A little later, they hear some other sounds. Mein Gott, mein Gott, was für Schmerzen. Aren't you going in? The husband asked. No, no, it's not time yet. Suddenly, from next door, there's an unmistakable cry. I beg a vault. The doctor threw down his cards and exclaimed, now it's time. Wait, what did she say? I ve is mir. Maybe that's what she said. If Freud's case study of Anna O oh had left unnamed the Hebrew or Yiddish in the hysterical disorganization of her speech, Freud's joke about the Baroness finally allowed that language to break through under the pressure of painful labor um, and the permission to break taboos that's inherent in the joke genre um, using the projection of this shameful eruption onto a frivolous, false Jewish woman. If Freud is the archaeologist with the pick, digging up inscriptions for interpretation or display, he is also this concealed, half-buried artifact whose multilingual monuments require our own deciphering. To lay my own cards on the table, it seems clear to me that the stratified site the depth model of the modern Jewish psyche that I've been tracing here can no longer be upheld for theoretical, sociological, and psychoanalytic reasons. We should not be misled by the neutrality of Weinrath's terminology of external versus internal bilingualism, nor taken in by the familiarity of the Moschelic architecture that places Jewish languages insides and European languages as the surface or exterior of the Jewish self. While, for, while Gordon called for such an arrangement in his 1866 poem, by 1870, in a different poem, For Whom Do I Toil?, he was lamenting the rush of his generation of modernizing Jews to European languages, leaving him without a, Hebrew, uh, without a readership for his Hebrew work. 
nor should we be drawn in by the post muscular nostalgia that views Yiddish as not contingently, but rather archetypically the mother tongue, with all others being covers for the authentic, shameful, primal Jewish interior. A.J. Heschel compared American Jews to inverse Muranos, Jews in the streets and only people in the sheets. Weinreich himself learned Yiddish as an adolescent, and Yiddish speakers are now made in the classroom as often as in the bedroom, advertised on t-shirts and mugs, and performed in jokes as expressed at moments of great pain and drama. If the joke about the Baroness is useful for exposing the stratified archaeology of the psychoanalytic subject in its isomorphism, sorry for that word, in its having the same shape as the architecture of the modern Jewish self, it may also be helpful for dislodging this model. Let's leave aside for now the oddity or even offensiveness by which the grunts of a laboring mother stand in for a language, or the way that the joke identifies the woman as a laughable, suffering monument to a Jewish past buried under French and German soil. Let's focus instead on the social situation in which the joke circulates. And notice that this is a curious reversal of the scenario of archaeological discovery, calling attention not to the unearthed inscription or to the, depth inter the deft interpreter who decodes it, but rather to the inhabitants living in the vicinity whose understanding of the mysterious runes they live beside is rendered as useless as the hapless husband who takes his suffering wife at her French or German word. To pursue the analogy further, to focus on the multilingual Jewish performance of the joke rather than the Jewish multilingual in the joke is to begin to notice the difference between the archaeological site Freud visits by analogy and the actual artifacts collected in his rooms. That Freud's work on jokes begins with a scrapbook reminds us that his archaeological in interests found their from fulfillment not in digging, but rather in collecting. And in this collecting, the artifact is wrenched from its historical context and its provenance obscured. In this sense, Freud's joke might be read not as the exposure of an authentic interior self, a token of a buried Jewish path, past, but rather as a fetish or commodity that signifies the bourgeois economy in which the joke circulates. What the joke represents is not Yiddish, but already its translation, distortion, reworking, decontextualization, fragmentation. Freud's Jewishness, read through the telling of this joke, can hardly be separated from its appearance as a byproduct and within the framing of acculturation, in which Yiddish appears not at birth, but within a joke about birth, embedded in non-Jewish languages, and within, it, within a discourse whose Jewishness is signaled as much by French and German as by Yiddish or a primal scream. The multilingualism of Freud's joke, vibrating with what it conceals as it exposes, by what it has forgotten or cannot, cannot express as by what it fluently delivers, by what it defers and then performs, is as Jewish a site as the bedrock of Yiddish or any other Jewish language. But these distinctions no longer hold. Do Jewish languages really come from some interior location, expressing our souls? Or are they, like all languages, imposed and scribed upon us from elsewhere? To put this, el to put this otherwise, is Yiddish the Mamalashan? or perhaps just another language that speaks the name of the Father. Perhaps this is what Freud meant when he wrote in his essay on the uncanny, we ourselves speak a language that is foreign, and nowhere more so than in what we imagine to be our deepest selves. And yet, as a Jewish studies scholar, I keep digging, searching for that precious artifact buried in the archives, which by some lucky chance will be bilingual and allow me to decipher the long ago event it commemorates. 
Here, for instance, is what Max Weinreich called his Freud laboratory, a schoolboy notebook and a multilingual glossary in which he worked out what Freud might look like in Yiddish in preparation to translate Freud into Yiddish. This document is here, upstairs, or wherever they hide it, in a box. The very site that Max Weinreich, the YIVO archive, that Max Weinreich called the collective unconscious of American Jewry. As in the joke about the Baroness, as in the hidden languages of Anna O, these linguistic artifacts present themselves as the rungs of a ladder that reach down to a primary source, a primal past. As with the joke, I can hardly ignore that it is a fragment paraded out before a contemporary audience wrenched from its living context. And yet, as scholars, tellers of Jewish jokes, and archaeologists of Jewish artifacts, we can hardly escape the lore of the buried self, the monument that promises to unlock the secrets of the past. The surfaces over which we pour repeatedly invite us to discover what they also insist that they hide and name this open secret the very Jewishness of the Jewish self. Thank you. Should we do Q&A or something? Do we have a little time or did I, on time and under budget? You probably want to know why I started with that YouTube video. Because <laughs> I start everything with Leonard Cohen. Hi, um, I'm wondering if um, you've discovered anything um, in Freud's writing about dreams that relates or can be compared to kind of Jewish concepts of dreams and dream interpretation? Yeah, um, Freud um, in the interpretation of dreams mentions Joseph. He actually, the, the beginning of the interpretation of dreams is a little history of how dreams were understood. And he spends at least a page or two talking about why he's not Joseph, <laughs> if, I, if I'm remembering right. so. But other people, just the same structure I'm describing, other people have said, no, you are Joseph. So this is one of those cases in which, and Freud himself talks about negation as a form of affirmation. So anytime someone's, you know, no, I'm not a whatever, I'm not a racist, oop, you know, I'm not a racist. Uh, maybe you're a racist. So um, the, you know, a, a Jewish dream interpretation is actually openly described in, in, the, in the interpretation of dreams, which is 1899, one of his first major work. Um, so it's something that he was thinking about. And there are people who, as I said, who believe that his, uh, the debt he owed to certain Talmudic dream interpretations was a, a much greater than I think Freud himself would say. Very fine. Um, I wanted to ask, what do we uh, call the uh, women um, that have the um, neck uh, garb on in, from the uh, presentation? Or is it a particular era, I think? This, the one there, yes. Oh, this is a really interesting um, uh, picture. Does anybody know what this is? I'm sure some of you do. This is a, um, so, um, Bertha Pappenheim was, and thanks for the question and also for the compliment, um, Bertha Pappenheim was a great, 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 great niece of Glickel of Hamlin, who's, who's the, you know, the first, her, her memoirs, whatever they are, it's still not clear what the genre should be called. Her memoirs are, are the first significant piece of writing that we have by a Jewish woman. Um, and Bertha was incredible. Bertha, I guess I should say, was very proud. Oh, and there's her again. That rough. So uh, somehow there's a. Uh, I don't know how she. I, I forget. Maybe there's someone here who knows how she knew what Glickel dressed like, but what this rough was. But Glickel's dates are from um, 16. 
40 maybe to 17, 20 around. So th that's the garb. Glicka was a, a, a well-to-do woman. Um, and for the, um, I, I'm trying to remember what, what she used that image for, but she, took, she had this outfit made for herself and she um, wore it. Uh, I, maybe for her own translation, I forget what she used it for, but she, this is a very famous drawing of her, or is it a photograph? It's a photograph of her. Um, so I, don't, that, I wish I remembered more. I can't even remember where I got this, but it's, it's, it's striking that she, just a form of intense identification with this ancestor. She, and and it, this is part of her Yiddishism. She basically believed that German-speaking Jews needed to know something about Yiddish. And, yeah. Um, I wanted to focus on the fact that when Israel was founded and they had to pick a language, they picked Hebrew and deliberately did not want to pick Yiddish, which they saw as the language of oppression, and I wondered where, whether there are analyses as to how that decision impacts upon Jewish identity. And that's interesting. Um, I, I'm thinking back to my dissertation, <laughs> which um, was about the, the uh, relationship between the, the uh, Hebrew and masculinity and Yiddish and femininity. and I wasn't thinking too much about psychoanalysis in those days, I don't think, but I think a kind of psychoanalytic reading of the Hebrew revival uh, is would, in which um, there's, there was a, a, a kind of suppression of Yiddish, and Yiddish was seen as a threat, as something that was liable to erupt at moments of great trauma. Um, and Eliezer ben Yehuda, who's considered the father of the Hebrew revival, actually tried to train himself to dream in Hebrew um, and it, it, there's some really interesting material about the early days of the Palestine Psychoanalytic Society um, around the question of what Yiddish meant and what Hebrew meant psychoanalytically. And um, there's an essay by someone named Emmanuel Velikovsky, who's later became well known as a sort of flying saucer UFO guy, but was an early Hebrew Zionist psychoanalyst. And he wrote a, a, a paper that was published in Freud's journal Imago um, asking whether uh, Hebrew could ever be the language of the unconscious in a society in which everybody was learning it from scratch. Um, and he said that in those places when, in which people would report a dream in Hebrew or a symptom that somehow had a Hebrew, you know, their symptoms are often puns. So they're linguistically coded often. So he would always ask himself, well, what's the Yiddish, or I guess Ladino or Arabic, what's the, what's the word that sounds like it? And it's probably that. Um, so he basically concluded that, that Yiddish was Yiddish, and, and these native languages were the language of the unconscious in, in the Zionist settlement, or the, at least among the neurotics that showed up for psychoanalysis. Hi, this is, might be a little bit off topic, but I'm wondering if you could expand on, you mentioned it briefly, the concept that German-speaking Jews in the 19th century retained some fragments of Yiddish or some influence of Yiddish for four generations, and, and if you could um, explain again what the scholar who said that was and, and add a bit more about that. I think it's in, it, why is that, that's not at all off topic. Why is that any, anyway. Uh, so I, I, I believe that's in History of the Yiddish Language by Weinreich. I think he says that there. I forget exactly where, and I don't, this paper doesn't have footnotes, but um, what, what I think Weinreich means, he might expand there, it's worth looking at it. You know, Jews spoke a certain type of Yiddish, a certain type of German that was, you know, had traces of Yiddish accent, you know, Mauschlin, sometimes it's called, to speak like Moshe. Um, and 
these effects are, I mean, African-American speech, there are linguists who trace, who, who discover certain uh, traces of African languages. So that's more than four generations at this point. So in other words, languages reproduce the, the effects. This is what's called um, linguistic interference. Um, so uh, there's some linguistic interference of the German that you speak by the Yiddish that originally, and the first people who went from Yiddish to, to, to German spoke German in that way. And then the children, they're not necessarily speaking a German that remembers that it's inflected by Yiddish, but the German that they speak has the, bears the traces of the Yiddish of the first speaker that moved to German because it's, it's reproduced from generation to, to generation to the next. So he claimed you could talk to a German Jew who you know, had never heard a German sentence, in, a, a Yiddish sentence, and reconstruct a kind of prior Yiddish there. Is this mi microphone odd? I'm so sorry, was it just annoying you the whole time? I don't know if being further or closer is better. I feel like there's a hiss. There's like someone hissing at me. Shh, shh. Really? Hi. Uh, hi. This is so like perfectly timed. I'm just very excited for this. Um, first, I just want to say about Velikovsky is that he was like a, a Hussid of Freud's and tried to, uh, he had his own psychoanalytic take on Moses and like, you know, analyzing the Israelites. He then subsequently, he wasn't into UFOs. He believed that you could explain biblical events via uh, astronomical events, like uh, the such and such eclipse was, you know, the moon being, I don't know, hit by a comet or something. I love that you're a Belichowski expert along with everything else. <laughs> he is really weird. So Everybody go home and Google Velikovsky. <laughs> he was a pointless shit. Anyway, um, you know, I'm thinking of that famous quote from Max Weinreich talking about American Jews that, you know, at some point American Jews will search out who they are. They will be driven to search out who they are. And he uses a metaphor, an image, which I realize now is very much tied into his study of Freud, which is, I forget exactly what it is. I don't know if you remember. It, it's something like, I think there's a lamp involved and it's, I think it's about like going down into the cellar. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I know. About? I need this. Where is this? Uh, it Don Miron quotes him. Oh, I it's mean, in the Don Miron? Yeah. In the... Okay, well, you know it's what to, to... Yeah. So it, but it's, it's very much like this, this image of having to go down stairs. There's, you know, shining a light, like excavating right, right. that knowledge. But, and I think I, I mentioned to, this to you privately, like, it seems that one of Weinreich's unfinished works was approaching this question of how to psychoanalyze American Jews because American Jews don't have this internal and external bilingualism. They, they lost these things. Like what, was there even They're a inverse Muranos. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. Well, no, I mean, that's my question is, is was, was there a, a, a preparation toward a psychoanalytic understanding? Yes, absolutely. Weinreich, I mean, it's the, the, the big project of Der Weg zu unser Jugend and the big, Max Weinreich's big psychoanalytic project, which was also fascinatingly informed by race studies. So he was influenced by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, about uh, the split self of the, what Du Bois talked about, that it was the job of every African American to become a whole person, which took a certain amount of, to, to, between who they felt themselves to be and how they were seen by others. It was an amazing project that Weinreich was involved in, and the whole thing collapsed in the 40s when he moved to the United States, and he felt like he couldn't get a handle on American Jews. He had all these weird, like, for a while, he thought it was, it was some sign of Jewishness was if he knew any Yiddish, and then he decided that it was the true sign of the persistence of Jewishness. He was also really interested in, and he was so cutting edge, he was actually interested in the language of the body beyond language. He actually, he believed that Jewishness was transmitted to pre-linguistically from mother to child, including the distinction between Jew and non-Jew, which a baby in his mother, her mother's arms would feel the, the fear when they're in the non-Jewish neighborhood 
and feel the openness in the Jewish neighborhood. And that, the, the bodily transmission of Unzara and them, you know, I'm sorry about that. Um, and he also said that the way to really tell whether, the, whether there was any, any Jewishness persisting in an, an American Jew was not how much Yiddish they knew, but whether they were afraid of dogs. That the fear of dogs was, he's talking about what, you know, what scholars now call habitus, these built, the built in history, the way in which we carry our people's history in our bodies through uh, things like whether you're held more tightly in some streets than others. So he was getting very deep, and then he, and then he gave up when he met Americans. He, we disappointed him. I mean, he did other work. He did historical work. But his great project of really psychoanalyzing what it meant to be a Jew, and he wasn't sentimental about it. He didn't believe it was inbred. He believed it was imposed. He wanted to know. He actually writes about circumcision. He says, we have yet to fully understand what the trauma of circumcision is. And there's no doubt that. And he says that circumcision is a trauma. And there's a counter trauma is what Jewish mothers do to their sons to make up for what the fathers did to them. So he had some wild ideas of how to psychoanalyze a collective. Um, and his spirit is so in this project much more than maybe it seemed in the, really it should have been Max Weinreich looking at Freud. For all these people who want to know who Freud was and how Jewish he was, all they have to do is read Max Weinreich, and he explains it all. Little Hans, afraid of horses. Well, yeah, I mean, talk. <laughs> Weinreich had that cold. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, thank you. I just had a question sort of about um, whether maybe there's more to say, or whether you think there's more to say about seeing Weinreich and Freud as sort of two opposite sides of the same coin in their sort of transition from Yiddish to German in opposite directions, respectively, with Weinreich basically growing up Thank German you. and transitioning to Yiddish, and how that fits sort of with their, their place in the German academy and the academy at large, and how they were trying to find their place. And I mean, with both of their doctorates basically coming from the German scene. Yeah. That's so beautifully put. I really do feel that way, that, um, that, that things come to the surface in Weinreich that are that are actually a kind of, that, that for, in, in some ways, the, the psychoanalytic interpretation, which brings a level of truth to, in some ways, Freud's work in German is a symptom. And it requires Weinreich's Yiddish translation and psychoanalysis to unearth some aspect of it. I think that's why, just to bring us back to why I made you listen to that YouTube video, other than I love it and you know watch it all the time. Um, is because I feel that, that, that Daniel Kahn's version of Hallelujah has that same relationship with Leonard Cohn's Hallelujah that um, Weinreich's translation of Freud has with Freud. And Weinreich's translation of Freud is so interesting because, you know, it's part, and, and you never know, like, what exactly he's getting at, but Weinreich, when Weinreich translates um, Trieb, which is a, which you, um, which drive, y you could use the Yiddish word, there's a Yiddish word, tree. he calls it um, yetzer. Um, to, to choose, you know, obviously if you're Weinreich, you want to go Lush and Kaidish with your Yiddish because that's the nationalist YIVO project. But what you end up doing when you do that to Freud, what, when you say that the, the, the sexual drive can be translated as yetzer, the vistas that open up on what, you know, what that means about Jewish approaches to sexuality, what the rabbis had to say about sexuality, um, the fact that you can do that. You can say, and the rabbis say, look, you know, if we didn't have, it's called the Yetzir Hara, but if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have eggs for breakfast, right? I think that's what they say somewhere. So um, I, love, I love how you put that, the, 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 the double-sidedness. I don't want to exaggerate it. I fall into it, but I think it's there. Hi, my name is Hazem. I'm a beginner student here. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, Weinrich um, and this idea that Yiddish, even if 
um, a Jewish person forgets it, it becomes dormant, it becomes sort of inside of them. Yeah. Um, because I, as far, I'm, I'm not a literary scholar myself, but I'm aware that in literary studies there is this idea, especially when studying diasporic and multilingual writers, that, um, you know, like I heard before, that there's this theory that Kafka is writing Yiddish in German and, and so on. So I was wondering if Weinrich and his work ever looked to literary studies or has, there, has that relationship ever existed? Wait, I was following you till the very end. So has Weinreich, what, what, would, what would happen if Weinreich, I, 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 I'm not following that, just that last sentence, what, what, what you're getting at. Oh, sorry, uh, if, just like if you've seen a relationship between his work um, with the idea that um, sort of the, the Jewishness of language yeah. isn't just in the fluency of language itself, it's something more intrinsic, if you've seen any kind of relationship between, between his right. work. The, 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 the Freud style, in the same way that you yes. could say, I mean, I think what Kafka says is that he has no language. You know, I, Derrida says it, I have no native tongue. Um, Weinreich was a literary scholar. He was a, you know, he has a Bildergeschichte von Yiddish Literatur, about 19th century Yiddish literature. It's important, and it's interesting that that's his, he's interested in the literature of the Haskalah. So the Haskalah is an interesting place to go, right? The first step toward Westernization and what constitutes the Jewishness of Haskalah literature. It'd be interesting to look at whether there's a psychoanalytic institute, uh, institute psychoanalytic inflection to uh, his, his literary analysis. I, I, I don't remember it well enough to say. We're going to take one final question, no. but I just want to say that Richard Griebitz is Richard Griebitz? You left your credit card at the front, so I have it. Um. Thank you for a very inspiring uh, talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you present, presented Bertha Pappenheim. Uh, you remarked that she made a remark about the writing of Yiddish, Yiddish writing. Uh, I had never heard a remark about the writing of Yiddish. I mean, one hears a lot about the oral part of Yiddish, but not the difficulty <laughs> of writing. And I was wondering if you had uh, any, any ideas on that. You know, I had like a quarter of an idea, and it showed up in the sentence, and now I'm realizing that I only had a quarter of an idea. But, but so I, I was thinking, you know, her, her paralysis started with her right hand, this connection to this psalm um, and then there's the fact that the one place where she talks about writing Yiddish that I'm aware of in her writing is when she stays up all night translating a German report about the involvement of, of, of Orthodox girls or Galician how do you say that Galician Galician or um, pimps and prostitutes in, in, in the international white slave trade when she's translating her report for the Alexander Rebbe to persuade him to get involved in her struggle, she also talks about how her right hand is stiff. And that was the triggering symptom of her hysteria, which was a serious mental illness that lasted for years. Breu Breuer didn't cure her. Um, so th this is what I mean by it. it just, the resonance struck me, but I, if I were really good, I'd think on my feet, I would understand what, is this a recurrence of that trauma? Is it, I think what you're getting at maybe is that another aspect of the sort of the myth of Yiddish is Yiddish retzich, Hebraish darf meredin. Yiddish just flows out of us. Ideally, it's, 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 its fluency is prized, right? But she's not describing herself as absolutely fluent in the writing, and writing itself is, so, how and she, uh, so yeah, you've just raised a lot of interesting, interesting thoughts that I I haven't. If this 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 eventually is going to be a book, and I'll have a lot more space to play with these ideas. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you so much. Thank you.